This special edition episode of the Writer Dojo was recorded in my hotel room. The sound isn't great, and there's not much we can do about it. Enjoy! Welcome to the Writer Dojo! With your host, Steve Diamond! That's me! And Larry Correa! Howdy, partners! Today's episode, Interview with a Totally Different Vampire! Hey everybody, welcome back to the Writer Dojo. We are super pleased to be back with you. This episode is coming at you from Texas, as you probably heard from Larry. Larry saying, do, doing his best Texas impression. Uh, I thought that was pretty spot on. I thought it was identical to how everyone here in Texas speaks. Um, that's a total lie. Everyone here has been awesome. So we're recording this episode, Larry, from FanCon, where you're the guest of honor. Yeah, it's been a great con. They've done a great job, just good people, uh, having a good time, eating barbecue. Eating some awesome barbecue. I know people are going to care about that. Yep. Ate a lobster bigger than my head. It was large. It was awesome. And we have a special guest star tonight. We do indeed. And uh, we're going to be recording quite a few episodes from here because FanCon is loaded with some awesome guests this year. And uh, and our first guest is David Carrico. David, introduce yourself, man. David Carrico. I've been writing since uh, 2004, and still writing. You, you managing to hang in there a little bit? Yeah. Excellent. Did you get your start in the 1632 universe? Yeah. Um, I, st- I actually started writing in, in 1978. I didn't make my first professional sales until 2004, and they were to... Eric Flint for the Granville Gazette. So they were stories in the 1632 universe. And a, a good bit of my published work is still within that universe. And we're, we're, big friend, we're big fans of Eric Flint, and we've talked about him on the show before. Uh, he was a guy who just went out of his way to, to help a lot of people get their starts. Eric paid it forward better than anybody I've ever met. And every, you know, I've, I've been a professional writer since 2004, and every major step in my career, he was involved in one way or another. Uh, it, uh, I've never, he, he was a wonderful mentor, and I've never worked with anyone that I, I thought, as I said, paid it forward better than he did. Oh, and that's awesome. Um, David, we were, we were at a signing a couple nights ago. Yeah. And we were up there talking about it, and we, everyone, th- this, this one person asked, and I don't remember who it was, but they asked us to each kind of pitch our book and talk about it. And when it got to you, and you pitched your most recent book, um, The Blood is the Life, I kind of stopped and I thought, okay, this is, this is a totally different idea than I've ever heard before. And then when we just had the Bain Road show a little bit ago, you, you, you kind of pitched it in another way, too, that I thought was equally awesome. So I was hoping that for our readers out there, for our listeners, too, I guess, I guess there were listeners, like they're reading the podcast. Um, if you could talk about what your newest book is, and from what I understand, you have a pretty interesting story about how you came up with it. Yeah. <laughs> um. The history of the story goes way back. It actually dates back to late 2009. Uh, I had just finished writing a major project and I was sitting in my office one night brainstorming, trying to figure out what's the next story I'm gonna tell. And, you know, like most writers, my brain is full of all kinds of odd facts and trivia and uh, you know, loose information and factoids, just, you know, all kinds of weird stuff will float to the top when I'm trying to brainstorm. And I, I was going through this, I was staring at the wall. My wife always said, what are you, what are you doing? And I was, I'm working. No, you're not. You're staring at the wall. Yes, I'm working. <laughs> I was staring at the wall while I was going through the brainstorming process. And all of a sudden, one of the things that floated to the top was a verse out of the Bible. And it's uh, in the 17th chapter of Leviticus, there is a a verse that's of significance to the Jewish faith. And it 
it paraphrases something like this, you shall not eat blood, for the blood is the life that is sacred to the Lord. Now, if you know anything at all about Jewish culture or Jewish religion, you know that that particular verse is the cornerstone of, of what's frequently referred to as the kosher laws. All of the Jewish regulations about how you slaughter meat and how you prepare and serve food ultimately are based on that one commandment. They, you know, they expanded a lot, but it all starts with that one commandment. So that thought crossed my mind, and you know, I'll grant you that's not the typical kind of thought that would, you would think of when you're brainstorming, but it crossed my mind, and my mind then followed it up with this thought. Wow, that would be a problem for a Jewish vampire. <laughs> I, I hope you guys can see so so this is kind of how how Dave pitched this um, during the signing and, and then during our, our subsequent Bain Roadshow event and as soon as you said that last line I I just started shaking my head and I thought oh my gosh like Larry and I always talk about how ideas they come from weird places and and it's really easy sometimes, I think, uh, to just kind of discount and be like, ah, that's too weird. And I think a lot of people would have discounted your idea and said, ah, that's a really weird idea. But instead, you thought, okay, okay. So this this could be cool. So, so what was, so I'm curious then, like, did you immediately think, yeah, this is it. This is it. Or, or did you have to stew on it for a little bit? Well, the, the next thing that happened was immediately after that thought, I had this mental visualization of an Orthodox Jewish man having an existential crisis because he lives to obey the law. That's how he gets personal fulfillment, is obeying those laws. And now he can't even exist without breaking one of the major laws. And I, I had this moment of just literal vis visualization of the guy just melting down. And I decided, okay, crazy as it sounds, this is a, this is a story I want to pursue. Because from that came the idea of how would some, a man of faith deal with becoming a and that, that's what really drove me to write the story. Now, I didn't start, I wrote 2,000 words that night. I wrote the initial vignette, but then I stole because I didn't have an ending. And you have to understand, I'm not an outlining writer. Uh -huh, that's right, people. You heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here. Dave is my people. We, we have had this discussion on this show many times. We, we, we are divided into tribes. <laughs> well, I can write from an outline. I can write from somebody else's outline. I collaborated on two novels with Eric Flint, and I, my current writing project, I'm collaborating on a third novel with Eric Flint, even though he's passed away. I can write from somebody else's outline. I just suck at trying to write my own outlines. <laughs> Uh, I get, you know, I'm one of these people, I start, uh, I can create an outline, I start writing, I get, I get 500 words into the story, and I've veered so far away from the path that's in the outline that I start getting obsessive, compulsive about, okay, I have to stop and fix the outline. I spend more time fixing the outline than I do in actually writing the story. So I gave up on that. I call myself a discovery writer. Yes. I stole that term from Brandon Sanderson. I think it's a little more dignified than seeing the page writer. I feel so vindicated at this moment we, in time. We, we have had this episode where we have I talked about so this. I feel so vindicated. This, this, is, this is how Steve, this is exactly how Steve writes. Yep. Okay. Uh, now, my normal writing process is I normal, normally get the character first. And then somewhere between seconds and minutes and weeks later, I get the problem. I get the issue the story is going to be about. And then the third thing I get, and again it may be somewhere between minutes and weeks later, I get the ending. 
I have, I generally have to have those three things to start writing. Now, those three things amount to a 50,000 foot view of an outline, a very minimalist outline, but I have to have the ending to start writing because everything is pointed to getting to the ending. And I'm not one of these guys that can skip chapters. I can't write chapter one, chapter 12, chapter 47, chapter four, chapter 19. I cannot do that. So I write very linearly. I start on page one and I tell the story until I get to the end. So you have to have those two factors to understand what happened next. I wrote that 2,000 word vignette and I stalled because I didn't have the ending. How long did it take for, for that ending to kind of percolate into your mind? This story currently holds the record for taking the longest period of time in my professional career to get from the moment of inspiration to the end of the first draft. 11 years. Wow. Okay. And I think it, I had about three story ideas that I got at the end of 2009. And I think all three of them, uh, the first two I consciously put aside because I knew it didn't have the chops to tell it yet. And I think the third story, I think the muse put it aside because I didn't have the chops to tell it. But from that point on, this story was a constant source of irritation because every time I thought of it, I wanted to tell the story and I didn't have an ending. So it's, it sat in the mental shelves for until March of 2020. We went from 2000, late 2009 to March of 2020. And it came to mind, I had just, again, I had just finished the project, I was trying to think of what I wanted to do, and it came to mind, and this time it brought the ending with it. And I jumped on that sucker. I started writing immediately. Now, the other funny thing you have to know about this is I am notorious for underestimating how long a story is going to be. I have also struggled with that. Tony Weisskopf has repeatedly laughed at me when I've told her what I want to write and she tells me no that's not one book that's two books or no Larry that's not a trilogy that's five books etc yeah, I, yeah I feel your pain on that one yeah if I tell you a story is going to be 7,000 words it'll come in at 12. If I tell you it's going to be a, a 10,000 word novelette it'll come in at 16. If I tell you it's going to be a 20,000 word story it'll come in at least at 25 maybe 30 or 35. Uh, in this particular case, I honestly thought it was going to be a long novel. I thought it was going to be 20,000 words, maybe 25, 30 at the outside. And how long is it? Well, at the end of October, when I finished writing the first draft, I had 91,000 words. <laughs> I mean, it's just a really long novel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it did, it's a you know, turgid novelette. <laughs> it was a full-blown novel. It snuck up on me. So, you know, that, that, that's the story of how I got there. But when I started, when I actually, you know, rather gratefully got to start telling the story, I had to sit down and figure out, okay, what kind of story am I going to tell? The third humorous thing about this is I'm not a van fan of vampire stories. I'm not. I don't like the old gothic horror Dracula type stories. I don't care for the um, paranormal romance Dracula stories. Mm -hmm. God forbid I really don't like the glittery stories. Well. Okay, that's fair too. Um, there's two that I like, that I do like, that I liked well enough to keep on my shelves for a while. One of them is Robin McKinley's book, Sunshine. Great book. Which is, that takes the whole urban, paranormal, fantasy, vampire trope in a very different direction. Yeah. That one, I connected. And the other one, there was a series of books that Barbara Hambly wrote several years ago uh, featuring a non-vampire character named James Asher as the protagonist. 
but it's set kind of in Elizabethan, not Elizabethan, in Victorian period. I mean, uh, Queen Victoria's on the throne. The first book was called Those Who Hunt the Night. And that series connected them with me because the characters felt plausible. I, I, I connected with the characters, I connected with the way they operated, and I kind of enjoyed those. And that series, I think, influenced me because I, I ultimately decided I'm going to write a rational, plausible vampire story. And before I started writing, I actually sat down and uh, looked at all the standard vampire tropes. Can't see them in mirrors. Silver is toxic to them. Sunlight, they turn into ash immediately. They turn into a bat and fly. Uh, you know, powers of hypnosis. All of, the, all of the standard tropes, I sat down and I divided them into two categories. I said, okay, it's either mythic or it's plausible. And a high degree of the Standard tropes ended up in the mythic column. So I was left with a handful of tropes in the plausible column. So then I had to sit down and figure out why are they plausible? I had to come up with rational, they didn't have to be realistic, but it needed to be rational reasons why these would be characteristics of a vampire. And I went through that process. And I ended up coming up with medical justifications for all of them. And, uh, and then I was lucky enough to already know Dr. Rob Hampson, world-renowned physiologist, and I sent him a note and said, hey, I've got a vampire story going, I've got some medical stuff in the, in the story, would you, would you vet my science for me? He said, sure. I said it to him. And, very quickly, a lot faster than I expected. He came back and said, okay, this works, this works, this works. This kind of works, but you, it works because of this rather than what you got down. Uh, he told me a couple of things I just had totally wrong, and then he suggested a couple of things I hadn't even thought of. Well, that's Rob Hansen, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's Rob. So my, I feel comfortable with my science because Rob checked it out and Rob said it's good. Once I got that all started, I started telling the story. And I wrote, like I said, I wrote 90,000 words in roughly, what, the early March to late October, what's that, six months? Seven, six, seven, seven months. months. For me, that's fast. I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not a John Ringo that turns out 60,000 words in 28 hours. Yeah, but that's not the healthiest lifestyle. Oh. Screw that. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Anyway, so I started telling the story, and the driving force in telling the story was this concept of uh, you know, the, the elevator speech I gave in, in the, at the, uh, the book signing. You wake up and you're super, but then you find out that to be super, you have to regularly and consistently do something that you find morally repugnant. What does that do to your head? What does that do to your mind, to your, to your self-image, to your worldview? How do you cope and adjust to that? That was the driving theme while I was writing the first uh, draft. Draft, that's the word I was searching for. Okay. So, this has been awesome, and I'm super excited that we're talking about this. What we're going to do really quick is, before we continue on with this discussion, we're going to take a really quick break, uh, let you listen to all of the ads that someone's recorded for us, probably producer Jack, and then we'll come right back. The wrong crew, the wrong ship, the right captain. Idealistic Navy Lieutenant Jacob Grimm just wanted to honor his mother's sacrifice in the last great war. When he's forced to return fire and destroy a squadron of ships to save his own, he thinks he's the hero. Until they discover the ships are full of children. Disgraced and denied promotion, Jacob's career is over. That is, until the head of ONI needs a disposable officer to command a battered destroyer on the rim. 
there's just one problem. Interceptor hasn't had a CO in months, and the ship is a mess. Worse, the system he's assigned to is corrupt, and on the verge of an all-out civil war with the Alliance. However, no one told Jacob he was disposable. Pirates, smugglers, and caliphate spies complicate the situation, and one captain with an old ship can't enforce the law, let alone stop anyone. The single greatest discovery of all time is about to change intergalactic politics forever. If Jacob doesn't find a way to succeed, then it won't just be the end of the Alliance. It will be the end of freedom for humanity. From USA Today best-selling author Jeffrey H. Haskell comes a military science fiction epic in the tradition of Honor Harrington and Star Trek. If you love heroes and starships, you will love to stand with Commander Jacob T. Grimm. Against all odds. You're in the Navy now. Welcome back. Uh, while we were gone, Dave and I gave each other the, the secret Discovery Rider handshake. Um, gave each other high fives. Thumbed our noses at Larry and his in his atrocious outlining policies and procedures. Uh, it, was, it was a great time. We all we had a wonderful time. Um, now, Dave, as we were talking about things, I, I one of the things that you brought up I thought was really interesting. And what you said was, I had to decide what kind of story I wanted to write. And so I'm really curious, um, where, what were some of the paths that, that, that you went down with this? I'm, I'm assuming horror was one of them. I'm a big horror guy, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you would assume writing a, a, horror, a, a vampire story that most likely it's probably going to be some variation of horror. And I specifically didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do a story that dealt with as I said, was a plausible, rational story, but dealt with that issue of how do you cope with being something that you find is morally repugnant and is already an accomplished thing in you and is totally irrevocable. How do you cope with that? And that was what I that was what I was trying to explain all through writing the first draft. That was what, what was the thought that was prim, primarily in my head. Um, you know, move, you know it, I didn't want a typical vampire story. I, I wanted to have a plausible rationale for it. And I didn't want the horror aspect to it. So that, uh, that those were decisions I made earlier. I made, I had that set in my mind. I hadn't gone through all of the work of, of filtering the tropes, but as soon as I decided to, to write the story, those were, those were intuitive decisions I had already made up front. And, uh, so that, that makes this a very different story. And there is darkness in the story, but it's not the darkness of horror and uh, demonic influences or anything like that. It's psychological darkness. Because the protagonist begins in a very very dark psychologically psychological place where he's questioning am I Jewish anymore? Hmm. He's questioning am I even human and he has that psychological, that existential meltdown that I talked about. He has that meltdown in chapter one, where he is questioning, am I even acceptable to God anymore? And this is a man of intense personal faith. And he's questioning, somebody did this to me. Somebody changed me. I can't change back, but according to our laws, Am I even acceptable to God anymore? Yeah, it, one of the things we've talked about on the show a lot is uh, conflict, introducing conflict for the characters. And it sounds like you had golden conflict uh, from the get-go with this character to explore. 
that was, I mean, looking at it objectively from the outside, absolutely that's what it was all about. I mean, that's, you can't have a more intense conflict than the question of, am I human, am I acceptable to God, am I even worthy to exist anymore? You can't have anything more intense than that. So that's what started the story. And the rest of the story is an exploration of the thing. The, the central character's name is Haim Khan. Everything that Haim does to try and figure out who am I now, what am I now, and what can I do to continue to be a man of faith in the way I am now? And one of the side things I wanted to do, science fiction and fantasy has a tendency to be a little dismissive of people of faith. Yes, it does. Larry and I talk about this all the time. And I wanted to seriously explore how would a man of faith deal with an issue like this? And I think I got to the end of it. I think the story works. But that was, that was, uh, that was really what was behind the story and that was what was really in the front of my mind as I was writing the first draft. Now, oddly enough, when I got to the, toward the end of the first draft, I wasn't quite done, uh, I had to look back earlier in the story and see how I handled something to try and keep the continuity straight. So I went back and I ended up rereading the whole first draft and when I got done with it, I went, huh, I've written a coming of age novel. <laughs> that is funny how that happens when, when you're really close to a manuscript. Uh, you will have themes in it that you don't see because mm -hmm. you're too close, but then you take a break and you go back and you read it again, and you're like, oh, wow, I'm really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I should have recognized that that was going to happen because I set myself up for it because Heinem is 18 when the story starts. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense then. Yeah, so it, but it's not the typical modern YA angst-ridden teen dealing with angst uh, I mean, dysfunctional family or dysfunctional society or both. This is, a, this is more of an old school coming of age story, a real building's woman as the, the literary teachers would call it. A man has something fundamentally changed in his life and how does he cope with it? How does he develop from that? That's, that's, that's what came out of it. So I'm curious, uh, it, you and I, it sounds like we have very similar processes. Uh, when you mentioned earlier that you had to know what the ending was, did the, was that the ending you stuck with or did it change at all? I don't have to know the ending in nitpicky detail, but I have to know generally what, what the resolution is going to be. And uh, I have, in 14 years, 17 years, however long I've been selling professionally, if I don't know what the ending is, I literally can't write. In fact, when I when I went when I went to collaborate with Eric Flint on the, the space opera of the Span of Empire, he and his original co-author was Katie Whitworth, but she died of cancer in 2012, and Eric brought me in to help finish the story. She had just barely gotten started on it. She wrote three chapters, and then there was supposed to be a three-chapter space battle, and then, uh, but she didn't do space battles. She left the space battle chapters blank for Eric to write, and then she went on to chapter seven and she picked up with the story that part of the story that she was telling. I sat down. I was going to let that blank stay there and let Eric deal with it. I was going to write the story from where she left off. I couldn't do it. I could not, my, the muse would not let me leave that big hole in, in the, the first part of the book because everything that I write is based on what came before it. You're and, a psychological completionist. You can't have that gap and, and it, 
it just gnaws at you. If you know, I'll accept the label because that is exactly the case. I I cannot leave a blank in in the middle of a story, which is what which is why I can't be one of these writers that writes chapter one, chapter twelve, chapter forty seven, chapter four, chapter twenty nine. Yeah, I, jump, I can't do that. I jump around. Uh, I I am I am that guy with the chapter four, chapter thirteen, chapter two. I will go through and I'll just put a note in the manuscript. It's just XXX, so I can go back and just, because I'll get to scenes. I don't feel like writing that kind of scene right now. I can't do that. I mean, uh, I cannot subjectively, intuitively understand that process because it absolutely does not work for me. The, the beautiful thing of this is there, there, it's, it, there's no right answer. It's yeah. uh, whatever works for us as a creative. And so, if that's the process that works for you, if anybody else is out there listening to this and that and they feel the same way, you know, there, it, there's no. That's one thing that one of the reasons we started doing this podcast is we would run into people who would uh, preach the one true gospel of creative writing, yeah. and they would have their rules of creative writing. And, and as, as we're seeing tonight, you can have wildly divergent process and still be really effective as a storyteller. Yeah, I. I got really frustrated with Mike Resnick one night when he he was talking at the table and somebody said something about, oh, my characters made me do something today, and he looked over and said, my characters would never do that. They always do exactly what I tell them to do. And I just looked at it because I can't tell you how many stories I've had, including The Blood is the Life, where a character who was supposed to be a minor character walked on stage and took over the scene. Larry, oh man, that, I think it was, oh gosh, this must have been a really early episode for Other Dojo where we talked about kind of the, the layers of characters, and we talked about that exact thing, how suddenly one of these characters walks on and you think, oh crap, well, I, I, I know people are going to be asking for a book about this character soon, and, and well, I guess this scene is about this character now, whatever. We, we talked about how we would introduce, like, we basically divided, like, primary characters, secondary characters, and tertiary characters, you know, with tertiary characters being stuff like, oh, you know, guard number two, or, you know, thug. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they had such a fun personality that they're now a secondary character, or even sometimes a primary character, because they surprise you. And so, I, I hate to say this, I, I got to disagree with Mike Resnick on this one. Yeah. It, uh... I mean, in the case of The Blood is the Life, in, I think it's in Chapter 3, Chaim meets some other Jewish people who are experienced in unusual situations. <laughs> and one of those characters was created to be on stage in that scene to bring in one piece of information. He not only took over the seed, he took over the role of being the mentor that I had designed for another character. He went to being, you know, one of the top three characters in the book. I'm curious, what, when you were writing this new book, what was the most, what was the most challenging aspect of it for you? Um, the most challenging aspect in this book was not a technical issue. Oh, what, what, what was it then? I'm not Jewish. Ah. And I have a great deal of respect for Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish society, Jewish religion. I have a great deal of respect for all of that. And I know just enough about it to get myself in a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And it was important to me that I get the Jewishness of the character and the, the circumstances right. So who did you, did you go to someone you knew that was a, like an expert that, that was Jewish that knew about all this stuff? After the fact. Okay. The first thing I did was I spent a couple of days considering whether I should even whether I should even attempt it. Because it was, it was important to me personally to get it right. And I, 
Yeah, I had no qualms about some Twitter head going, you're culturally appropriating. No, that was not the issue. Mm -hmm. The question was, can I tell this story right? Can I get it right enough that Jews will not be, you know, put off by reading the story? And that's and I'm using Jews in a positive sense there, not in a, in a derogatory sense. And I thought about it for a couple of days, and I ultimately decided that the reason I was going, and I decided to go forward with it, and the reason why I decided I was going to go forward with it is although I am not Jewish, I am myself a man of faith. And I felt I could understand how Haim would feel in those circumstances enough to be able to tell the story properly. I think, I think, you know, Larry and I, we're not, we're not shy about admitting that we're very religious and, and men of faith as well. And when, when you initially pitched it, and I heard, I heard your last line, you know, like, well, crap, this would be a, this would be a whole mess of a problem for a Jewish guy. Um, that really, that really hit home for me. And I think that's what, that was the hook that once you start describing your book, I thought, okay, okay, this is good. This is really good. Because again, as a, as a guy of, as a guy who's religious myself, and, and, and I know Larry can identify this as well, identify with this as well. I understand that. I get that. I get that, that difficulty. It makes sense to me. And so it's really easy to, to identify and feel with the character. And, you, and when you do tackle an issue like that of other people's face, you want to be respectful, but you also want to like have, as an artist, you still want to be able to create the art that you want to create. So it's it's kind of a fine line. So when Steve and I wrote um, a Jewish rabbi character in uh, Servants of War, we uh, wrote the character once again to the best of our ability as a man of faith, also a man who had been kicked when he was down, so he's a pretty broken guy. Um, but so we actually brought in uh, you know people who actually practice and that is their belief system to say does this pass the smell test does this feel right to you um, are we writing this guy correctly are we not are we not screwing this up yeah. and actually for this author that did it for us was, it was Mike Rothman Michael Rothman did it for us uh, and I'm also his um, I'm his speaker for Mormons so <laughs> <laughs> well it when I wrote the first draft and I submitted it to Tony, her initial response was, I like the concept and I like the writing, but I have some issues. And then she gave me a five page written critique of what I had submitted and said, uh, if you're willing to do a revision, I'll be willing to read it again and make it, make, maybe make an offer at a later point in time. When you got that critique, I'm interested. What was your gut reaction that instant you saw it? I was on cloud nine. Nice. Because that was the first time that any professional editor had ever given me that response. That was a major milestone in my professional career. Now people, I, now, now all of our listeners, I want you to, to think and if you need to rewind the podcast or whatever and listen to what Dave just said and, and listen to that a couple times, I encourage you to do so. We, we had an episode just, just a little bit ago talking about developing a thick skin and, and talking about you know, taking positivity from things. It would have been very easy for you to, to say, ugh, well, she wants me to put in work and that sounds awful. And, and look, we all know people that would have had that attitude. But instead, I love what you just said. You were on cloud nine because you, you said, oh, dang, this is awesome. Tony Weisskopf, who's a freaking superhero, said, I can make this work if you're willing to make it work. Yeah. I mean, this is my 16th published book. This is the first book that I've had this kind of of response from an editor where they were willing to invest their time and their effort to make my book better. Mm. And yeah, I was on cloud nine for days afterward. 
and my, you know, probably five seconds after I finished reading that email, I sent her a note back and said, I'll start the revision now. So, you know, the, the primary theme of the book was right, was the, uh, the exploration of how do I cope with this change. The secondary theme of the book was the idea of a um, coming of age story. There was one more theme of the book that developed that again, I didn't see initially, but Tony noticed it when she was reading the, the, uh, the second draft. She said, you've got some elements in here where you're exploring questions of justice. I want you to develop that more. So there's a, a constant third theme in the book where we talk about what is justice? Is it an absolute? Is it a relative? Is it something that is imposed by society? Can we develop justice for ourselves? Can we make our own justice? Those questions float through the book and are constant uh, discussion points that Heim has to, to deal with as he becomes the new person that he is. Oh, man, that's fantastic. Um, I hope everybody that you've enjoyed this conversation as much as Larry and I have. We've, we, we love hearing people's processes. We love hearing people's experiences at the writing because with, when they're writing. And before we ask Dave one final question uh, to to leave with the with the with the listeners here, there's there's one person that we really need to thank really quick, and his name is Todd Wilkinson. And he was able to help us get the audio square for this, um, lend us some equipment, and make sure that, that everything's all good and, and, and feeling good. And so thank you so much, Todd, for that. Um, if you're listening, awesome. If you're not, we'll, I'm sure we'll make Jack go find you and hunt you down. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, Dave, parting words here. For our listeners out there and all the aspiring authors, if there's one little piece of advice you could give them, what would it be for you? Heinlein's first rule, you must write. If you don't write, nothing else happens. And the second rule is, finish what you write. Finish what you start. If you can't do those things, you're not a writer. Awesome. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, for listening to us on the Writer Dojo. We appreciate all your support. We've been here at FenCon, but there's been just this outpouring of support for us here, and we appreciate it so much. Uh, and Dave Carrico. Uh, his book is called The Blood is the Life, and that book just came out on September 6th, which uh, at the time of recording this is like a week ago, I think. Uh, so please, go buy that book. Grab it on Amazon. Go to, Bar go to Barnes & Noble and grab it. Um, buy his book, read it, and leave him a review because that's what, that's what really helps us. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, it really was a pleasure. That was fascinating stuff. Appreciate you guys, it was a lot of fun. All right, well guys, thank you so much again. This is the Writer Dojo, and we'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea, produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nibo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Ate a lobster bigger than my head. It was large.